So hi, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I'm sure you all have uh, other places to be. My name is Ami. Like Mark said, that's pretty much what I do. And the links on the screen will tell you what I do in recent years, mostly focused on training. And if you want to get in touch, you can visit my website. It's, uh, I apologize. It's pretty bad, but there is a contact form there. And uh, you can see my LinkedIn and I also posted, I'm going to post it in a minute, uh, the demo database that I'm going to be using for today's session uh, is available on GitHub. So that's about that. This is the demo database that we're going to use. It's called the Animal Shelter. And there's actually a whole project database. Uh, if anybody is interested, you can see it on my uh, main LinkedIn repository as well. But the version that I'm going to use today is a subset of the, of the full project. And you can get links at, uh, with all the data. It's not a big database, but it's going to be fun. And it has uh, all the necessary tables that we need to demonstrate what we're here for today. So let me just get you quickly introduced to the database. And while I'm at it, I cannot, I'll never give up an opportunity to discuss my database design choices. And you can immediately see the first thing that there is no surrogate, single surrogate key to be found here. So for example, if we look at the animals table, you can see the key is species and name. And this is the business key that I chose for animals. This is what I believe will be the most convenient business way of staff and shelter staff to communicate between themselves when they want to reference an individual animal. So Donald the duck or Jerry the cat, right? This is, some, this is the natural business key that you will use. You will not use, okay, who is animal ID 57? And I don't want to get into that if anybody, some of you have been to my session about keys, but just be aware that this is going to be the database that we use. We have animals. We also have reference tables with the species and colors, which are the reference externally managed data. We have adoptions. We have persons, staff, vaccinations of the animals, staff assignment and staff roles. We're probably not going to use all of them, but at least some of them. And the topic of today's talk is about query logical processing. And it's kind of a fascinating topic because you're going to see it's, it's really a fundamental topic and it's one of the most fundamental aspects of SQL, which has huge, huge implications on everything that you do with SQL. But I still see very, very few books and very, very few courses that actually teach it. And understanding the syntax without understanding the logical aspect behind it uh, sometimes can get you into a lot of trouble and spend a lot of time scratching your head trying to figure out why things work one way and they don't work the other way. So it's a huge topic. We can spend a whole day on it. But today we're just going to cover the fundamentals and hopefully both the experienced among you and the uh, Beginners among you will come out with uh, some value from this. For the more experienced among you, I just ask that you be patient. I'm going to start from really the, the bottom and work my way up slowly, slowly. Be patient. It's going to be worthwhile. Let's start. What you see in front of you is SQL execution order. And as you can see, it is not the way you write the query. And this is going to accompany us for the rest of today's talk. And we're going to see exactly why this has such a radical impact on anything you do in SQL. Every query always, always begins with the from clause. And it doesn't matter if the from clause is just a single table, or as we'll see in a minute, even without a from clause, or if it has 300 levels of nested table functions, views, and remote text file calls, it all gets evaluated into a single data set, and that data set is then moved on to the next processing phase in turn. 
So if there is a where, it's going to get moved to the where and then down the line all the way until the last phase, which is the offset fetch. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to go one by one in order of execution and try to see how this actually impacts the way that you write SQL and why some of these impose limitations on what you can and can't do. And it's going to be a lot of fun. This talk is for everybody. If you've been to any of my talks, you know I like this to be interactive, but to a degree, right? So we don't want this to become a debate. And since we really don't have a lot of control, we left you the opportunity to unmute yourself. So if you want to ask a question, you can either use the chat. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. Hopefully, I'll see when somebody asks a question. But if you must speak up, then you're welcome to unmute yourself, ask a question, but please remember to mute yourself afterwards, because otherwise it introduces a lot of joy and a lot of noise and feedback, and that becomes, yeah, it becomes completely unbearable. So thank you for your cooperation in advance. Any questions so far? Okay, great. That's what I like. Yeah, be interactive. It's not like I can't see your faces. I'm not in front of you. So let's at least chat. Great. Okay, so from this is the first table that we're going to use. The animals table, we can see we have the species and the name. Remember, that is the key the primary color, the breed. Some of the animals are purebred. Some of the animals have no breed. We're going to deal with nulls very shortly. I promise you that's going to be interesting as well. Gender, birth date, color pattern, and admission date. SQL, uh, SQL Server, even though SQL in general doesn't allow that, SQL does allow for a select statement without a from clause. For example, I can select a string literal, SQL is fun, even without a from clause. And what's going to happen under the covers, SQL Server is going to assume for me a source data set, which is a dummy data set that consists of a single row and a single column. And it's going to be processed as if I had a from clause from any source that is a single row in a single column. Some other databases like Oracle require you to actually spell it out. So Oracle has a table that's called dual. SAP HANA has a table that's called dummy. Informix has a table that's called sysdual, but it doesn't really matter. What's important here is the processing order, which I'm going to hammer into your head today relentlessly. The first thing that gets evaluated is the from clause. The data set that is evaluated in the from clause gets moved on to the select. The sele in this case, of course, if we have, remember, we might have additional clauses. In this simple query, it simply skipped directly from the from all the way to the select simply because we don't have any of the others. And my first question to you is what's going to be the result of? this query. If I execute this query, what's going to be the result? Use the chat. Guess away. Would you, uh, would you get a row for every record that's in animals? Would. OK, to try to follow query processing order. What's going to happen? How is the query going to be processed? First thing, the animal table will get evaluated as part of the from clause, regardless of what's in the select. In this case, there's no joins, no fancy, it's just a single table. All the rows with all of its columns, and this is important to remember, will get evaluated and moved on to the select. The select evaluates each expression for each row from the data set that it received. In this case, it's the entire animals table, and you're absolutely correct that what we're going to get is the string literal SQL is fun, and this is going to be returned 100 times simply because we have 100 animals. So for some of you, it may seem weird, but if I put back the star, which gets translated underneath to all of the columns, you know what, let me put it uh, afterwards so it'll be easier to see. 
and execute it again, now you can see that all expressions, regardless if it's a string, it's a literal, or if it is, it is a reference to one of the underlying columns in the table, will get evaluated for each row that got to the select list. Okay, makes sense? Okay. Now, the same is going to be true when we move on, and you need to remember this, because now it's really pretty simple and ben benign, but when we get to the little bit more complicated query, this simple fact is going to help you realize a lot of what's going on under the covers. Remember, animals table got evaluated, moved on to the select. The select evaluates each expression for each row of the animals table. And by the way, all rows, and this is another interesting aspect of SQL, all expressions get evaluated at once. There is no order. So I can write, for example, a species and name and name and I don't know, a breed. And even though I, I spelled, oops, even though I spell them from left to right, they all get evaluated at once. And why is that important? Because if, for example, I want to use an upper function on the name and give it an alias, let's call it upper name, and then I want to be a smart ass and do a lower of upper name, what's going to be the result of this query? Anybody care to guess? It's spelled right. It will be an error. Why? Because upper name isn't defined yet. Well, it is defined here. I just defined it. Right, but they're all evaluated at the same time. Exactly. Because they're evaluated at the same time, that means that aliases that we, we put here, we cannot use in the same clause. We can use them in the following clauses. And it so happens that the only clauses that follow the select, the distinct is not really a clause. The distinct is, is an operator on the set. We're going to get to that in a minute. But only order by and offset fetch doesn't really reference any particular column. So the only place we can put it in is order by. This interesting aspect of SQL also has additional implications. So for example, if I do something like, let's say, create table T, and it's going to have call one int and call two int, and I'm going to insert T values one and two, and I'm going to do a select star from T. Now, one of the implications of the all at once op operations is that in SQL, and that's one of the only languages that we can do that, we can do something like update T, set call one equal call two, and call two equal call one. And because they get evaluated at the same time, we're not going to lose any of the values. In any other programming languages, if you do something like that, you set the value of column one to column two, you just lost the value of column one. And when you set column two back to column one, you're going to get both the same value, but not in SQL. In SQL, we're going to execute that, and we're going to select again, and we can see that the columns have been swapped. So that's another interesting aspect of the all at once. The all at once also applies to also applies to rows, not only to columns and expressions. So something we can do something like the following. So let's drop the table T for a second and make this guy a primary key. And I'll insert the values 1 and 2 and 2 and 3. And I'm going to run the following query, update t, set call 1 equals call 1 plus 1. And equal will be nice. So let's execute this guy. And here we are 
Again, in any other language which doesn't have the all at once principle, what's going to happen is first, this row is going to get updated and you're going to get a violation of the primary key. By the way, be very, very careful. I recently had a huge blunder during a course. I was demonstrating this and I was using PostgreSQL. And it turns out that in Postgres, you have to define the primary key in a special way so that it will be respected. And what happened is I ran this query and I actually got a primary key violation. However, in SQL Server, that doesn't, that doesn't bother it. And you can see that both rows got evaluated at, got updated at the same time without any conflicts. Okay, so that again is due to the all at once operator. Any questions about uh, all at once? Any question about from directly to select aliases? Yes, as there are question or yes, good so far. Let's move on. And now we're gonna deal with joins. So I'm sure all of you are familiar with joins. I'm not going to teach you the syntax of joins or anything. Let's say we need to do a join between animals and adoptions. I want to see all the animals with all their attributes. By the way, an interesting aspect of using natural keys is that you see that the species here and here, the species and name, because that's the key, that's also part of the key in adoptions. That means that any query that all that it's interested in is the, ident the real identifier of the animal, which is the species in name, doesn't require a join back to animals. So if I had something like an animal ID here, any query, no matter what, because when, you, when we look at adoptions, we don't care at the animal ID. We want to know if it's a dog, it's a cat, and what name. We want to actually identify the animal. That means that any query regarding adoption would always have to join back to animals. And here, when we use the natural key, we will only need to, you, to join if we're looking for any of the attributes which, is not part of, which are not part of the key. Another interesting aspect is also, you can see that the adopter email, which is the way that we identify people in our shelter, also becomes part of the key. Now we have a composite key that consists of three columns, which might sound like a bad idea, but it's actually a great idea because now you get your indexes set up for you, typically for all the queries that you're gonna be looking for. But that's, again, that's I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Any join consists of three steps, and I'm gonna write them down so we have them in front of us. The first is a Cartesian product. The second phase is called qualification, and the third phase is called reservation. And it doesn't matter which type of join. The only difference between the different types of joins is how many of these steps they actually go through. Every join, no matter which one, if it's an inner join, an outer join, full, right, cross join, every join begins with a Cartesian product. Cartesian product is known in SQL as a cross join. And if I write animals cross join adoptions, What's going to happen is that every row in animals is going to be joined with every row from adoptions. And the result set is going to be the number of animals multiplied by the number of adoptions, which in our case is 7,000 rows. We have 100 animals and 70 adoptions. So we still have 30 animals that have not been adopted yet. When I write, when I request a cross join, processing stops at this point and simply doesn't continue to the qualification phase. And the result of the Cartesian product gets moved on to the select. And as before, every row, every row gets evaluated for each expression, right? F, sorry, the other way around. Every expression is evaluated for each row. Also note that in this case, the star refers to all underlying table sources. So it's going to return all columns from animals and all columns from adoptions, right? 
you're familiar with that, no big deal here. Next step, if our join is an inner join, then after the Cartesian product is evaluated, and I'm going to leave it here because, you know what, but just to make it a little bit more clearer, let's do, so let's give it an alias. Let's call this AN, and let's call this AD, and I'm going to show AD.species and AD.name and AN.species. Breed. Let's say this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for adoptions, and breed is not part of the key, so that's why I'm doing the join. I want to retrieve the breed for each animal, and now we get only three columns, and that's going to be easier to look at. So remember, cross join every animal matched with every adoption. If I change the cross join to an inner join, what I'm asking SQL to do for me is to add another processing step, which is called the qualification step. The qualification step evaluates each row from the Cartesian product that we just created using a predicate, which is called the qualification predicate. And the qualification predicate, as you know, we specify it using the on clause. And in our case, you can see a management studio was kind enough to complete it for me so I don't have to write the huge join of species equal species and name equal name, which is one of the downsides of using natural keys. So your joins are going to be spelled a little bit longer. Right back. Let me write this again. OK. Now, just to make things a little clearer, let's add here an.species and an.name so we can see the species and the name both from this, both from the adoptions and from the animals. And you can see that Archie the cat got matched with his adoption row, but Archie the cat also got matched with Buddy's row. So this is the adoption row of Archie with animal row of body. Now, typically, that's not what we're interested in. Although there are cases that cross joins are useful, for the most part, if we want to see animals and their adoptions, we want to see it based on some common denominator. Namely, we probably want to see the adoption and the breed of the animal that was adopted, not the breed, the adoption of Archie with bodies breed, right? And this is exactly the definition of the qualification. The qualification qualifies individual rows from the Cartesian product based on the predicate, and only rows for which the qualification evaluates to true will be returned, all the others will be discarded, and what we get back in return is now, let me just put this so even though we don't really need it, uh, just so we can see that indeed we get Archie's rows, uh, animal row next to his adoption row, and Buddy's row next to his, and Cleo's next to hers, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so on, right? So I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Are we good so far? Make sense? Cool. Next, one of the side effects of an inner join is that all animals that were never adopted, so here you can see we got 7,000 rows. We got all 100 animals multiplied by all 70 adoptions, meaning we got 7,000 rows back. So we can see all animals regardless if they were adopted or not. However, once we introduce the qualification predicate, that means that any animal which doesn't have a row in adoptions is going to get eliminated from the result. And as most of you probably know, this is exactly what outer joins are for. But what's important for me here is not to teach you. I'm sure you all know outer joins. What's important is, again, processing order. After the Cartesian product was evaluated and the qualification predicate was tested for each row of the Cartesian product, now the result set moves on to the reservation phase, but that only happens if we specify 
an outer join. But you know what? Before we do the outer join, I have another quiz for you. What will happen if I execute this query? Ignore the outer join for a second. We'll get back to it in a minute. What's going to happen if I execute this query? Anybody care to guess? Cartesian product. Right, exactly. Right, as long as we follow execution order, no problem. Since we just said that every join begins with a Cartesian product and then the predicate is evaluated, the predicate that is always true will return all rows. And in our case, again, we get our 7,000 rows, which is the entire Cartesian product, meaning that this innocent looking inner join is actually a cross join in disguise. Now, moving on to outer joins. Outer join designates one or more of the sources as reserved. And the reserved set, or in this case, we're dealing just with tables, but this would be as true if we had a select query here or a call for a function. That's why I use the term set. The outer join designates either the set on the left or the set on the right as reserved. And what happens is that after the evaluation of the qualification, the reserved table gets a special privilege in which its rows, even those that didn't have a match, will be reintroduced back into the set and will be passed on as part of the resulting set, in this case, to the select. So in this case, if I use a left outer join, meaning that I want to return animals that didn't have adoptions, in this case, it wouldn't make sense to do a right outer join because if you remember, there's a foreign key, every adoption must have an animal. We cannot have an adoption without an animal. So a right outer join here is not gonna do anything, but a left outer join, and if here, let's just remember how many rows we got. We got 70 rows. That's the number of adoptions. If I use a left outer join, now we get 100 rows. And if we scroll down, oops, something funny happens here. And we can see that we get animals without a name. Anybody care to guess why? How come we get animals without a name? I know we have animals without a breed, but animals without a name. So the thing here, you can see the all rows that were reintroduced because of the outer join, since they don't have a match, and I kind of spoiled the fun a little bit. I should have removed this guy. That kind of gave it away. Lesson to note to self for the next time. This is what I wanted to show you. But anyway, as you know, because the animals that didn't have adoptions, they don't have anything to match. Therefore, we get a null back. And all we need to do in order to fix that is to remember to pick the key from the reserved table and not from the non-reserved table. And now we're going to see all animals, regardless if they had an adoption or not. By the way, since I'm only selecting properties, uh, attributes from the animal table. I, now I really can't tell which one was adopted and which one not. But typically, if we would want to see adoptions, we will also want to see something like adoption date. And now it makes perfect sense that all the animals that had a null for adoption date are the animals that were not adopted, right? Because adoption date is mandatory here. It doesn't show, but it is mandatory. Before we move on to the next clause, uh, you know what? No, let's move on and go come back to the come back to the animals later to the left outer join. The next step is the where clause. All the result, no matter how many joins we had here. One quick word about joining more than two tables. Let's say that we need to join the adoptions. We also want to show the pe the person who adopted the animal. And let's go back to the inner join first and add another inner join persons as P on P email equals AD adopter email. And let me just put a star here so we can just see everything that's going on. And now we get 
70 rows, which is our 70 adoptions. Every animal that was adopted with all of its animal attributes, all of its adoption attribute, but also all the attribute of the adopter himself, like the email, the first name, the birth date, address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that I see most often is that people get confused because as long as we're only doing inner joins, no matter how many tables we're going to join down the line, the order doesn't really matter. The result is always going to be only the rows that match each and every one on the way. But that is not the case with outer joins. So what's going to happen if I take this inner join and add it here to our previous query? And now remember, just a second ago, the left outer join, once we introduced the left outer join, that returned all the animals that were not adopted, and that resulted in all 100 rows. However, if I add another inner join to persons, what's going to happen is that all the animals that were not adopted are going to have a null for their adopter email which means that now they're going to get eliminated from the set, and now we're back to our original 70 rows. I'm sure you've all encountered it. The only thing that I do people see people do is instead of actually enforcing the join order, which is what we want here, because what we want is for the adoptions to be joined to persons first and only then be join back to animals using a left outer join and reserving the animals table. What I see most often is people just change all the joins to a left outer so that they can retain all the rows from the previous joins. And while this works and does give us the 100, the 100 rows, it can have devastating performance implications. You're not really leaving the optimizer a lot of breathing room. You're not telling him what you really want. You're telling him that you want a left outer join all the way from the beginning to the end. And there is a way around it. Does anybody know how to force join order without resorting to um, changing? And I see sometimes queries with 30 tables all being left outer joined because of this. Right, Nathan we can actually put parentheses around the, the join that we want to be processed first. What's going to happen if I try just the naive approach and put parentheses around adoptions, inner join persons, and try to execute this query, what's going to happen is I'm going to get incorrect syntax. And it's actually a bit misleading. Anybody care to, anybody know how we can, how we can fix this? Because uh, expression or the join in the parentheses is evaluated first, the reference to species doesn't make sense in this context. And what we need to do in order for this to make sense is to remove it and move it outside the parentheses. So this becomes this funny looking join which is animals left outer join adoptions seemingly without an on clause, inner join persons on, and let me just put the parentheses here so we can see them nicely. And this is a valid join, adoptions inner join person, where the reference is only to the expressions from the tables within the parentheses. So now we get on email equals on, AD, uh, AD species equal and AD name equal AN. Now, the funny thing about this whole thing, which by the way is called chiastic order, is that we actually don't need the parentheses. What did the trick here is moving the on. And at this point, I can get rid of the parentheses altogether. And even though it's somewhat less readable this way, this is actually what did the trick. So the fact that the on of between adoptions and persons appear first forced adoptions to be joined to, person, to persons first and then the on later, which joined 
adoptions and animals, first the joint to animals, and now if we execute this query, you can see that we get our 100 rows back. I don't necessarily recommend that you do it this way. I think it's actually clearer if you do keep the parentheses, but remember, it's just a visual aid. It doesn't really change anything. What is important is the moving of the on clause. Let's move on. Next, we get to the where clause. But now, what I want to do is I want to stop sharing for a second, and I want to switch. I'm just going to keep this query, so we have, I'm going to take it with us, because I want to show you some nice things that SQL Server actually doesn't have. And in order to do that, I'm going to be using PostgreSQL. And what I have here, I have a connection both to a SQL Server and to a PostgreSQL which so far work the same way. Before we combine it all together with all the joins and the where and the predicates and why processing order is so important, let's first have some fun with the where clause, just with a single table. When Dr. Codd first came up with his, the first paper that introduced the relational model, with a data model for large share data banks, it had no notion of missing data whatsoever. And it was only market forces that later forced him to accept the fact, the reality, that in the real world, unlike in academic papers, we have to deal with missing data too. And while he was reluctant at first to do that, uh, eventually he was convinced. And when Dr. Codd did incorporate the concept of null as an indicator for missing data, he actually wanted to have two separate types of nulls. The first null was called, he called it I values, and the second type was called A values. The I values was missing and inapplicable, and the A values was missing but applicable. And both refer to missing data. What do I mean? If we look at breed of an animal, this, what do you think this, uh, what type of null that would be? Would that be missing and inapplicable or missing but applicable? I would think missing but applicable. Missing but applicable. Okay. Anybody thinks otherwise? Okay. Let me give you another example. Does the animal which is a mongrel or like a feral cat, does he have a breed? Is a null indicator in the breed column represent something that we simply don't know or something that doesn't exist? Think about it for a second. Breed is actually the I values. It's missing and inapplicable. Why? Because a mongrel dog doesn't have a breed. It's not that it has a breed and we just don't know it, which would be the missing but applicable. It's an applicable attribute, but we simply don't have that information. So for example, we can look at select. So if we look at persons, we can see that we have persons which refused to provide their birth date. So we have a few persons with a null for a birth date. This is missing but applicable. It means that the person does have a birth date, but we just don't know it. The person for privacy concerns decided that he doesn't want to share it with us. Therefore, we have an indicator for a missing data, but the attribute is there. It exists. Alan Cook does have a birth date. We simply don't know it. That was not the case for the animals because a cat which is not purebred doesn't have a breed. It's not that it has it and we don't know it. It simply is inapplicable. For Buddy, the breed attribute is inapplicable. I see a few, aha, okay. That was Cod's original desire so that SQL would have both types of nulls and they would actually have this different semantics and logic. And that would have required 
instead of what we have today, which is three-valued logic, where every predicate can evaluate to true, false, or unknown, it would have required four-valued logic, which might sound crazy because even with three-valued logic, Chris Date once said about nulls that they undermine the entire foundation of the relational model. He, Chris Date was so fond of nulls, and by the way, so was Dr. Codd, but they simply realized that there was no choice. But the people who developed SQL, Chamberlain and Boyce, decided that this would make it too complicated. And instead, we have only one type of null that represents both missing and applicable and missing but applicable. And that actually, even though they tried to simplify things, as you'll see in a minute, it actually made things much more complicated than they should be. You're all familiar with the basics of ternary logic. I'm not going to go through that. So you know we cannot ask where breed equals null because a comparison, a mathematical comparison between any attribute and a null or even, it doesn't matter, even one null is never equal to another, which means that this predicate is going to evaluate to an unknown. And the where clause takes what comes from the from before it gets to the where, evaluates each row using logical predicates, and only predicates that evaluate to true will pass and make it to the select. So this query is going to get no rows are going to get back to the select. And the same is going to be where breed equals null is also going to not return a single row because any comparison between a null is always an unknown and the where only lets through rows where the predicate evaluates to true. But that has even more interesting side effects. So for example, if I want to say, want to look for all animals, let's take, let's take a dog, for example, a Weimar runner. Let's copy this. So let's say I'm looking for all dogs that are Weimar, Weimar runner, right? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm, I'm going to get all dogs that they have the explicit breed of Weimar runner, right? Which makes perfect sense. However, if I want to look for all dogs except for Weimar runners, now something interesting happens. Because I'm going to get back all the dogs that have a different breed, but I'm not going to get back even a single animal with a null breed. A mongrel is not a Weimar runner, right? Logically, you, you would think that in this case, we do want to get back. If I'm looking for all animals who are not Weimar runners, then I would like to see mongrels among them because they're definitely not Weimar runners. If I want to see all animals which are not Weimar runners, or all animals which are Weimar runners, this logically should return all animals. An animal is either a Weimar runner or it is not. But still, because of the way that nulls are implemented in SQL, we don't get a single non-breed animal. And that's one, that the reason for that is that Chamberlain and Boyce, for the most part, decided to treat null predicates as if they were of the missing but, uh, missing but applicable type. And for a missing but applicable type, this actually makes sense. Because if I look for all persons where their birth date is different than where their birth date is different than October 21st, 1973, because birth date is of the second type, that's an applicable, uh, that's an applicable attribute that we simply don't know. If for this query, not returning people with an all birth date makes sense. Because they do have a birthday, it may or may not be October 21st, we don't know. 
But if I'm looking only for people whose birth date is different than that, for the people where we don't know the birth date, I probably don't, I don't want to show them because I don't know whether they do have that birth date or not. But that is not the case for the missing but inapplicable like here, where breed is different than Weimar runner or breed is equal to Weimar runner. And now you can see why COD wanted to implement both. And I think that if Chamberlain and Boyce would have listened to COD and would have implemented both types, and we, and we would have to have, you know, some some sort of different syntax to be able and some sort of different semantics to be able to distinguish between them it would actually simplify things and not make them more complex but that's water under the bridge what do people do these days when we want to see animals which are not weimar runners what would you do in order to include those that are also non-breed so the most common thing that i see is or breed is null so we add an explicit predicate breed different than weimar runner or breed is null and if i execute that and of course i'm going to get what logically should have been returned from just this predicate now i'm going to get all the weimar all the all the animals except for the weimar runners other people will also do i see occasionally something like is null breed comma i don't know some value doesn't matter what is different than weimar runner and this too would return the correct result which means we're going to get back all animals which are not weimar runner logically including those that are non-breed however this too has devastating performance implications and it doesn't matter not, not only is this completely unreadable SQL is at its best when it reads like it's plain English. When your SQL looks like plain English, your SQL is going to be clear and efficient and will perform well. Once you start adding this weird logic, regardless if you do it with this or with the or, it's the same. Now, the optimizer has many more execution paths. We're dealing with multiple predicates with an or between them. Even though SQL Server is relatively smart, other databases are less smart. And a query that could have used an index, for example, on breed, once you do this, no longer can use the index and it's going to scan the whole table and it's going to introduce concurrency issues. And again, not to mention that it's simply ugly. SQL Server, although SQL Server doesn't support it, SQL does offer two ways to deal with it, which are supported by other database engines, such as PostgreSQL, for example. So, of course, I can use the same. Now, this is a connection to a PostgreSQL instance. And, of course, I can use the same technique, but there are two additional very interesting techniques does anybody know? Anybody heard of distinct predicate? Okay. So instead of the mathematical different than Weimar runner, the ANSI SQL supports a distinct predicate. And it's spelled as follows Is distinct from Weimar runner. And the idea here is that although nulls are not equal to one another, and since they're not equal, they're also not different, but they are not distinct from one another. When I say breed is distinct from Weimar runner, that means all breeds which are not Weimar runner, but also all breeds which are null. And that's much more elegant, much prettier, and much more English-like, right? Breed is distinct from Weimar runner. Remember, nulls are not equal to any other value nor to themselves, but they're not distinct from them. They're, they are distinct from other values and not distinct from themselves. The same way, there's also is not distinct from Weimar runner, what do you think this will return? All of them, all, all the uh, Weimar runners. Correct. 
So this is the same as before. Excellent. But that's not the only one. There's another very, very cool and elegant feature of SQL, which is called a truth test, which we can also use to solve this. And a truth test, unfortunately, also not supported by SQL Server, but is supported by Postgres, is a logical operator that tests the result of a predicate and is spelled is or is not true, false, or unknown. What I can say is something like that. Where breed equals Weimar runner is not true. And is not true will evaluate to true on both if the predicate inside is either a false or an unknown. Only when it is not true, meaning either false or unknown, will this entire thing evaluate to true. And now I'm getting back all the breeds, including the non-breed animals, but of course, without the Weimar runners. And what do you think will happen? How can I do the same using a truth test, but with different than operator? Is true. Is true. All non Weimar runner, but no yeah, no. Nulls. Why? Because for non-breed animals, this expression evaluates to an unknown. So it's not true. So this whole thing evaluates to a false. It's not false. Right? So how would you do that? You have to look whether it's either true or unknown. But of course, it doesn't make sense. So it's much more clear and easier to understand when you write it like this, where breed equal a Weimar runner is not true. And this is going to return all non Weimar runners, including the non null ones. But I think the previous one, the distinct predicate, is actually cooler. And this, this is what I call SQL being plain English, right? But unfortunately, if you're with SQL Server, you're going to have to re resort to either using the is null function or using or predicates. And this all goes back to Chamberlain and Boyce being stubborn and not wanting to implement COD's idea. So anyway, we're about halfway through the session. We still have a lot to go. And so what I suggest is that since we still have all this, Mark, what do you say we make a part two out of it? Or do you think it's better if we continue? Oh, I, I was I had just typed that into the chat when you were when you were saying it. So yes, that'd be great. Yes, and so what we're going to do in part two is several interesting th things. First of all, we're going to see, or maybe if you want to stay ten more minutes, there's one <coughs> more thing I want to show you. One of the questions that I often see is when does it matter if we write the predicates as part of the from meaning as part of the on clause, or when we, do, when we write the predicates in the where clause. And this also goes back to query processing order. So let's take the following example. Select star from animals as a, inner join, adoptions as ad, adoptions as ad, on an dot species equals a d dot species and a n dot name equals a d dot name and this is one of the places where azure data studio can still still is lagging behind a bit so this returns all animal adoptions and let's say that i'm only interested in seeing weimar runner adoptions let's see if we have any a n dot breed Weimar runner. So let's take this query and let's take another query. So let's execute, let's execute. These are both the same. So far, so good. What would happen if instead of the where clause, I would change it 
filter for a Weimar runner to be part of the join. What's going to happen? Is it going to make a difference? Same result, right? Same result, we see all five, all of our five Weimar runners were adopted, right? As long as we're dealing with an inner join, because the end result is going to be both only animals who qualified based on the predicate of species and name. And even though here in the query, the left query, this gets evaluated first, including the Weimar runners, only then the set gets moved on to the where clause where each row is going to be evaluated. Only the Weimar runner will remain and get moved to the select. On the right, this is considered part of the on predicate, but still it doesn't matter because only dogs who are spe who the species are the same, whose name are the same, and whose breed is a Weimar runner are going to get evaluated and moved to the select. However, that thing changes a little bit when we deal with outer joints. Now, if I execute the query on the left, we can see that we get all five, but I think all five were adopted. Yeah. So we still get all the animals that were adopted, but the one on the right, all of the sudden, returns far more rows. We get 100 rows. We get all animals back. And why is that? All I did was change the inner joint to a left outer joint. How come this returns because the five, five rows and this returns 100 rows? Because the one on the right is a left outer joint. It's going to join with every record. The one on the left is filtering out those records. You're, you're on the right track, but I would spell it out a little differently. And again, what we need to do is follow query execution order. On the left, remember, the first thing that got evaluated before it got to the where clause, and I can simply execute just this part of the query, you can see these are all animals, including all the animals that were not adopted, right? So all animals were either adopted or not adopted. The ones who were adopted will have non-null attributes for their adoption uh, attributes. And all those that were not adopted are going to have nulls. So here we can see, for example, for the adoption fee, here we can see all the rows. These are all the animals that were never adopted. As you can see, they have null species, null for everything, and the adoption date. This set was moved to the where, and now the where went ahead and checked each and every one whether or not the breed is a Weimar runner, and in return, only the Weimar runners. On the right, the predicate is now part of the qualification phase before the left outer join. Remember, animals will only be matched when we did the inner join. Animals were only matched if they had the same name in adoptions and in animals, the same species, and if they were Weimar runners. And remember, the outer join takes place after. So now SQL went back to the animals table and said, okay, all the animals except for these five didn't have a match, so I'm going to reintroduce them back into the set. And that's why we get all the Weimar runners that were adopted, but we also get all the other animals as well and we get all 100 animals back. Be very, very careful. Those with the gray hair among you remember that when SQL came out and the second ANSI SQL standard, ANSI 89, we, we used to do joins using comma-separated, comma-separated tables. So we had something like select star from 
animals, comma, adoptions, and then we would specify joint predicate in the where clause. And the problem was that this introduced so much confusion regarding outer joints, where not only every server had its own original way of denoting outer joint, SQL Server had this star equal. So we had animals dot name star equal adoptions dot name. Anybody remember this? But that's not the, not, that in itself is not bad. You know, the fact that it's not readable is one thing. But the fact that we could not separate the predicates that are used for qualifications from the predicates that are used for filtering introduced these kinds of bugs and a lot of hairs were pulled over this thing. That's the last thing I wanted to show for today because I still see people often confused whether they should put their predicates here or here. So now you understand and you understand why query execution order is responsible for all that. Uh, Mark, I think uh, we can stop at this point and we'll have a part two where we'll continue with group by and having and distinct and how we can work with distinct and group by together which, by the way, is available. And I'm also going to show you that having, unlike the common myth that I see often, is not limited to aggregate functions, but we can actually use non-aggregates and having as well, and whether or not it makes sense or not. But let's all do that in the part two of this uh, session.